Because uh, I usually, in a couple of conferences, I went after a Tony Kummer of White Dreams. And it was really hard to beat all that graphics and the whiz and all the, the drawings. This is even tougher. <laughs> um, I am going to talk about success. Uh, out systems, my company, the company we and my colleagues founded in 2001, is coined as one of the, one of the successes of tech startups in, uh, in Portugal. But uh, a lot of people mistakenly uh, believe success is associated to press, coverage, uh, actually to a lot of things that have very little to do with success. What we found is that the most canonical way of defining success is happy customers. And we didn't believe this in the beginning because we made a lot of mistakes. But uh, over the years, we actually tuned our measure, our KPI of success to be indexed to this particular mantra. And why is this important? A happy customer helps you sell the next customer much better. It works as a referral. It's the only way you can get known in the media because no one wants to write about you unless you have customers to talk about. Everyone talks with customers. Analysts, we have industry analysts, the only one to hear what are the customers story. And so we are lucky that we have 130 happy enterprise uh, customers. And these customers basically promote our product they recommend it to everyone, which is truly important. And they say things like this. And when you have a customer telling you that you've changed the way they live, you know you're onto something. And this, I believe, it's the definition of success. Now, how did we do this? And it's going to look like we were godlike in 2001, and we thought about all this ahead of time which is actually not true. It was a lot of trial and error. But what I'm going to, to present here is a little framework which I believe over the years I kind of tuned down to the absolute simplicity and it encompasses six major steps or questions that you need to fulfill in order for you to realize or to gauge whether you're going to be successful. The first one and this is where you start when you start a company, is pain. And I love this notion of pain. Pain means opportunity. What you need to do is search, is ask the question. If I have something, I'm thinking about building something or providing some kind of service. What is the pain of the people that I'm going to serve? And that people is the market. Are these people willing to pay for it? Now, as I was listening to the previous presentation, I was like, oh my God, can I just put my framework on top of that? And then someone asked that question, how much? Because that price, the price point, it's one of the most critical things you have to do as early as possible in your company. You have to define what is the value that these guys are willing to pay for your medicine so that their pain gets cured. Only then, and only then, can you deeply think about the product? And the reason why it's important, the order of this is important, is because a lot of people in Portugal actually start <coughs> with the product. A lot of tech startups start with the problem. And the problem of starting with the, uh, with the product or with the service is that in a lot of times you have what's called the solution looking for a problem you don't really isolate the pain, and you build something that doesn't have a real market. I see so many business plans like this. I wish people, when they think about the product, would go back to the two first, and really be honest with themselves and ask those questions. Now, as you kind of work these first three boxes, the next one that you need to think about is, what is your differentiator? This is not another coffee shop that you build and someone will come to buy coffee. This is, you have to create some form of competitive advantage where a lot of people and myself like to call an unfair advantage towards your competitors. What is it? It might be a patent. It might be an exclusive distribution rights with a supplier 
uh, I'm sorry, with a, a distributor or an exclusive to use some unique product from a supplier. Most of the times, though, it's linked to being the first. And being the first is a problem because you need to move really, really fast. Now, that takes us to the fifth step, to the fifth question. <coughs> if you have the product, you have the price, can you build it below cost? And this is another problem, is because when you're thinking about the product, and a lot of Portuguese startups do that, well, what they tend to do is that they put a margin on top of cost, and that's wrong because you either too low or too high. And if you are too low, oh well, you just left money on the table. But if you are too high, you will bankrupt because no one will pay the cost of that product. Now, when you have all this set up, you can define how your company is going to behave, and that means investing. Again, here, it's another fundamental problem with a lot of the way business startups in Portugal operate. Because a lot of them think about investment as if they don't need it. Well, I can work without a pay salary for one or two years. Well, most of the times they actually don't do that, they work part-time. And when you work part-time on a startup, your capacity, your chances of success just diminish one order of magnitude. So, investment is important. Now, let me use the OutSystems example here uh, as a mixed way of uh, showing all this is and uh, also doing a little bit of publicity for the company. Uh, pain. We were lucky that we actually stumbled, and I say stumbled because we didn't have this in the beginning, on one of the most, on, on a really very large pain. And that pain is related to uh, a situation that occurs inside IT departments. Between a very large percentage of IT departments, uh, uh, of IT departments' projects fail. They are either delayed or they are over budget. Extremely expensive. One of the problems with this is that business changes faster than IT, and so there is a disconnect between the processes that business wants to be changed or implemented and the IT systems that do that implementation. So, from a point of view of the business, IT, it's very rarely that an IT is seen as completely adequate. They're always somehow inadequate, and in a lot of times, very inadequate. Now, who is our market? I mean, this, the problem of IT is a problem that replicates across all companies, but when you define the market, you really need to zero down on people. So, for us, it's IT departments. We don't sell to business, we sell to IT. But inside IT, we have to drill down, and we sell to chief information officers. We sell to IT managers and software developers. And now, what is the pain of these guys, right? Well, if you are seen as not understanding the business, as slow, in a lot of cases as incompetent, I mean, in the necessary evil, the paycheck is actually not bad for IT people, but you know, you live 25 years not being liked. <laughs> is there such, it's, is that a higher degree of pain? A board meeting with the CIO and the VP of sales, where the CIO has to say to the VP of sales that the new system is again six months late. The guy calls him all, every name. Is that pain? Yes, absolutely. It's emotional pain. Actually, it's real pain. So, um, the problem with this is that IT people are actually pretty smart. It's a very unfair uh, set of affairs. Um, and the reason for this, there are several reasons, but one of the most crucial and fundamental one has to do with the way IT systems are built. This is what's called a typical gun chart of a project inside IT, where in this phase here, analysis, the IT asks the business what you want me to build. And then they go design and develop, which is program it and test it. In that elapsed time, 9 to 24 months have probably elapsed. And what happens is, when the business sees that system for the first time, that's usually the reaction. That's first the reaction, then they get mad. And uh, usually what happens is that, my God, this is not what I asked, or my business changed in the meantime because you guys took so long. Now, you can go back and fix it, 
this is again what is the one of the fundamental problems with IT is that technology has one nasty problem. It's called scope creep. And the technology today that's used to build the systems increases the cost of change by an order, <coughs> by almost two orders of magnitude. Empirically, one order of magnitude. Okay? So, given this pain, what was the type of product that we thought about? Agile platform, it's a product. It, it has some technology. I'll, I'll just briefly, 30 seconds, go through it. But fundamentally, what we did is, hey guys, instead of doing projects that way, why don't you do it differently? Why don't you do it using Agile methodologies? And this is something that we now foster, which is build something very small, go immediately to the business and show it, and you get that face. You get a really, really mad, uh, probably uglier, uh, business user. Okay? But now, she will give you feedback, you go back to your board, and two weeks later you show him again what you've done. And in that process, okay, which we call an agile project, so it's an iterative process, you go and you tune, both the business and IT tune the system towards not what is the business thought they were going to get, not what IT scope, but actually what they really need. And the problem with this is that at every one of those stages, you need to change. So that cost of scope creep looms in the horizon. And this is where we produce our innovation. We created the technology that basically reduced the cost of creep by an order of magnitude, between three and five uh, dollars. And so by doing this, and this is our product, the Agile platform, we have basically managed stumbled, actually, to solve one of the most endemic problems of IT. It's now using more than 16 industries. It's an endemic problem. It's an horizontal problem. And allows us to address an extremely large market. Now, what is our differentiator? Well, our differentiator is basically because we run faster. We actually had this crazy idea uh, at the time when we were building between 2001 and 4. A lot of people went to look, a lot of VCs, American VCs actually, tech VCs, went to look into this thing and said, you guys will never build this product, this is just too big, the problem is too big. And so we went ahead and looking back, actually, and I believe this is true, you actually need to be slightly crazy to be an entrepreneur at this level. Because the thing was just, at that time, not possible to be built. And it took us about seven years and a lot, an extreme efficiency in R&D to be able to build this. Now, is the differentiator going to be the same in three years? I don't think so. It's going to change. And again, that's one of the problems of the, the differentiators. They keep shifting. And so you need to go back to this little six-step framework and see and be honest with yourself, do I still really have this unfair advantage? And today, we can say we still have it, but... We're working very, very hard at innovating constantly. So we keep always on pushing that differentiator. That it's actually a pretty stressful way. But um, that's like in, in high tech. Um, and we adapt constantly. And so one of the things we had to do actually was a change of culture. The culture of our systems increase and change to be able to constantly listen to the customers, be humble address with the vision, and then re-implement the next innovation. Now, it takes us to operations, right? So, in operations, <clears throat> when in 2001 I was looking for 1 million euros of investment, I, I actually went to, to the UK, I knew a lot of VCs in, in the UK, not a lot, there's not a lot, but I, I knew a fair amount of them, and they, they, a couple of them actually offered me money, but I had to move the R&D center to, you, to England. And the problem with that is that I could not get the same quality people at the same cost in England. I couldn't. So the company would have been different. So I said no. I knew my operations required that. And so <clears throat> that quality that we've managed to put there created this differentiator that I now have. And also pervasive, it's pervasive across the whole, um, the whole company. <coughs> Everything we do is top quality. And again, it really, really makes a difference when you are addressing that major KPI, which is happy customers. 
So we control our costs constantly. This is part of the operations, right? Everyone flies economy. Now, this might seem... I, I have pretty, pretty senior people that I hire than the management team, for instance. They used to fly business. Now they fly economy. But everyone flies economy. I, unfortunately, need to also fly economy. Okay? And so this passes a, a notion that the company needs to be frugal, that we are competing also. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for trying, you meet <laughs> So, and then, <laughs> another thing that we do, that we discover actually, is that our revenues are growing, but the, our headcount is, uh, is stabilizing or going down. Now, how did we manage to do this? And this has to do with controlling costs. One of the reasons why we managed to do this is because we are implementing, as we scale, we always gauge whether, instead of putting throwing people at the problem, we can just basically throw technology. We use our own technology, we eat our own dog food, to actually prepare for scale. And because we are agile, as a company, we have this technology. We can actually, we have been, I have been seeing this. So, <laughs> again, a lot of journalists ask me, how many people do you have, as if that's, an indication of success. It's actually not, right? I mean, I am very proud of saying that I'm going down in employees, but they wanted me to be bigger. Okay? And fundamentally, a culture of greatness. Um, these five honest, innovative, honest, I'm sorry, smart, innovative, honest, agile, and cool was based on a survey we did on the old company. What were the five fundamental values they would see, they saw in uh, they saw in our systems. And this was based on the survey. It's actually funny, I was extremely surprised with the honest. Because why would you, out of 220 words, would you pick honest as far as the top five? But that also shows a new way of being in the internet, of being a type of company where you have to be extremely ethical because one slight misstep can basically ruin your reputation and your words. And so part of our Ethos is that particular one. And finally, investment. Okay? Investment for me is one of those uh, fundamental things. I've been in companies where VCs have basically uh, damaged the company. I've seen companies going down because of lack of money. Companies going down because too much money. Um, we've actually, over the course, over the eight years that have passed, uh, we have... Uh, uh, funded the company in 6.2 million. And if I look back, do we really need it all that money? No. Actually, we've spent very little of it. But the fact that we have it allows us to be in the marketplace in a different way. It allows me, for instance, to never even consider funding the company by not paying salaries I, or by not paying my suppliers on time, which is a way a lot of companies in a lot of places fund their operations by not paying suppliers. We don't do that. And that, the reason why we don't do that is because that creates bad karma. Bad karma is transmitted to the employees and eventually that bad karma will attack my customers. And then my KPI of success will go down. So if I look back at a success, just to summarize, for someone starting, First thing is, before you go and implement that exciting new product that you have, please, where is the pain? How much does your medicine value, is valued? Do, is it really a pain? Is your product a placebo and you think it's a great medicine? Be careful with that. Just make that little honest question and answer those questions very, very tightly. And then, go and get the funding that you need because working part-time or betting your father's economies, your parents' economies, or your house is a bad idea. A lot of these things, even with these six steps, even if you answer all the questions, you might fail. It's risk. And if you fail, you need something to fall back to, a safety net. And yet that safety net is your family, is your economies, is your house, 
Don't bet on those things. Thank you. Actually, honestly, we started about one and a half years ago, and this is when we start. I started getting the first rumors that because we were growing very fast. When you grow very fast, one of the things that starts you start seeing cracks in customer satisfaction, and uh, the first glimpse of problems was when we introduced the partner network and we scaled uh, with partners. We couldn't control the quality of the partners. And so uh, we moved very fast. Uh, we're still not completely there. We moved very fast. We spent a lot of money recovering some situations in a very urgent, very definite way. Um, and today we measure basically every six to nine months. But we measure informally almost daily. We measure near the people. Sorry? We measure near the people. Final service or the people that use the final we, we are a, a fan of uh, uh, what's called the ultimate question, which is something that was introduced, a framework that was introduced by a guy from Bain Company. Um, you need to answer the question, you need to ask the customer, if, if you had to grade the probability of you recommending your, this product to a friend of yours in 1 to 10, what would be the grade? And basically, you only need to stop when you get a 9 or a 10. If you get less than a 9 or a 10, there's work to do. A 9 or a 10 from the IT department, from the marketing department? From the IT. From the IT, which is our user, our customer. I have a question. You, you mentioned that the IT environment is very stressful. Um, how do you keep your team motivated on a stressful environment? Well, uh, <laughs> That it's a multi-part answer for one single question, but I think it starts with the, with the way we hire. Um, we have three tenets for hiring. Uh, it's high energy, uh, smart, and um, accountable. And the, every time we try to hire a non-high energy person, that person has floundered because of the, the, the pace of the company. Um, those type of people li love to work in these type of environments. Actually, the stressful situation, they love to go into an IT, and in a way, which is a very stressful environment, and replace that bad stress with good stress, because agile is actually pretty stressful, okay? But it's a, a nice form of stress where everyone is happy, it's just they're working a lot, okay? So, I think in a sense, people are very motivated for, by the fact that they like people to be happy with them. In a lot of cases, they come from other consultancy houses where they were forced to deliver projects that were late or over budget or whatever. No one likes that, and they got beaten in the head. And so, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you.